Hey, hello everyone. Thanks, Larissa. Thank um, my name is Rowan Lear. I'm joining you from Glasgow in Scotland, where I've been growing and caring for a seed library since 2019. And I am delighted to introduce the two hosts of this session. Lauren Buffalo Muscatine is an African-American and Indigenous woman, a mother, gardener, science editor and writer. She is the managing editor of the academic journal San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science and an affiliate of a Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She and her daughter co-founded the nonprofit Napa County Seed Library in 2020. She believes diversity is the engine of involvement. Pat Sobrero was born and raised in Northern California. She was a bookseller, then an elementary school teacher. She began working at the Round Valley Public Library after retiring from teaching and established the Seed Library there in 2013. She has become an advocate for food security in her remote community and believes food security begins with seed security. Okay, and I'm gonna mute myself and I'm really excited to hear this conversation. Hello everybody, it's really great to be here with you. Thank you, Larissa, and thank you, Rowan. My name is Lauren, and I live and work in Napa County. Napa County is situated in the North Bay area, about 45, 45 miles from San Francisco. Its area is fed by three major watersheds, the Napa River, Sassoon Creek, and Puda Creek, which feed the San Francisco Bay. The first peoples of Napa County are collectively called the Onasati, and they comprise the Wapo, Putvin, Coast Miwok and Pomo tribes. Their name for this land is Tallahalusi. Members of these tribes still call Tallahalusi home. They still live, work, and teach here, but their population is greatly diminished because early European colonizers destroyed their way of life. Napa's population now in 2020 or in 2021 was a little over 136,000. The economy here is based largely in tourism and agriculture, which is dominated by wine growing. My daughter and I co-founded the Napa County Seed Library in 2020 in response to the pandemic. Our mission is to grow, save, and share locally adapted organic seeds to benefit the people of Napa County. Our seed library operates as a network of little seed library annexes. We have four in the town, three in the town of Napa, and one in the town of St. Helena, and we have three more planned for this year. Thank you and welcome everyone. My name is Pat Sobrero and I'm representing the Seed Library at the Round Valley Public Library, part of the Mendocino County Seed Libraries. Round Valley is situated in the Northern Coast Range, part of the Middle Fork Eel River Watershed. Round Valley is home to Covalo and the Round Valley Indian tribes. The area is the heart of Yuki territory, which at one time stretched from Humboldt Bay to the upper Russian River area. In 1856, the US government established a reservation in Round Valley and forced other Northern California tribes into the valley. Today, the Round Valley Indian tribes include Yuki, Pitt River, Little Lake Pomo, Nomalaki, Konkau, and Wailaki peoples. The valley is seven miles in diameter with one paved road in and all the other roads leading out are dirt. We're an hour's drive from the nearest town. The official population of the town of Kovalo is about 1,100, um, but realistically there are between four and 5,000 people living in the valley and surrounding hills, many off grid. Ours was the first seed library in Mendocino County. The county library system now has six seed libraries in branch libraries and a seventh traveling seed library on our bookmobile. What is a seed library? A seed library is a place run for the public benefit where community members can get seeds for free. Many seed libraries are in public libraries or community centers. For some communities, getting folks to garden and grow some of their own food is the focus. For other communities, seed libraries may be created as an important step to develop a network of seed savers, to create locally adapted varieties, 
to respond proactively to climate change or seed shortages, and to keep seed in the control of people rather than ceding that control to corporations. Here you can see the seed catalog in the Round Valley Public Library on the left, and one of the Napa County Seed Library annexes, the one at St. Mary's Episcopal Church on the right. What a seed library offers is equity, the right for the public to freely access and grow seeds, which are the foundation of food. If we further consider the question, what is, the, what is a seed library beyond its physical representation, we find magic and resonance. When I hold a seed, I marvel that each seed actually is a library of information that tells a story about the history, ancestry, survived environment, and expressed experiences of its parent. Each seed then is also a library. Why start a seed library? Well, saving and sharing seed can foster independence and well being, build meaningful relationships with friends and neighbors, and strengthen a local food system. Seeds adapt to conditions of the local environment, which is a powerful agent for growing resilient crops in a changing climate. Did you know that from 1903 to 1983, we've lost 97% of plant biodiversity within vegetable varieties? Since the 1980s, it's become worse, but also seed saving has enjoyed a reprisal and seed libraries are increasing in number. It is up to us to rebuild that diversity to ensure that our food remains healthy, regenerative, and abundant. I started the seed library at the Round Valley Public Library in 2013 with the idea of building food security in a very food secure community. We're food insecure because of geography. We're remote and could be easily cut off from surrounding communities in an emergency and often are. We're food insecure because healthy, affordable food is not a reality for most of the population where food prices are very high and 95% of the student population qualifies for free lunch because of poverty. And we're food insecure because people over the last 50 years have become so far removed from knowing how to grow and prepare the food that they raise and have become dependent on food that's trucked in from long distances. I learned about seed libraries when daily life changed remarkably during the pandemic. I realized I was fortunate because I had a few seeds in the garden centers and my town were open, but that wasn't the case everywhere. I wanted to follow the model of housing our seed library inside a public library like Pat does, but the universe had other plans. Our main library was unable to take on the project during the pandemic because of limited access and limited staffing and shifting objectives. So our seed library took a grassroots approach and created little free seed library annexes placed in neighborhoods. I wanted to place seed libraries where people live, pray, learn, grow food, and eat. We could access and use them even during the shutdown and purposely take our time to connect with the earth and to each other as we grew fresh food, well-being, and resiliency. There are seed security issues to consider as well. The widespread seed shortages following the COVID-19 pandemic illustrates how valuable it is to have a local supply of seeds in every community. There's no real food security without seed security. Saving and sharing seeds also keeps seeds in the hands of individuals at a time when huge multinational chemical companies are buying up smaller seed companies. 60% of commercially available seed is controlled by three companies, Bayer, who purchased Monsanto, Dow DuPont, and Kim China, who purchased Syngenta. These three firms are all active in the production of herbicides, pesticides, and GMOs, and over the last two decades have shown an interest in developing patented seed rather than preserving heritage seeds. There are many groups you might find to partner with to get your seed library up and running, to co-host events with, or share information and in seeds with. The organizations we've partnered with are in bold. 
Our Friends of the Library group was instrumental in getting us up and running and provides us with a budget each year to purchase things like envelopes, labels, seeds for special projects, and to pay shipping and handling for seed donations from commercial companies. If you're situated in a library setting, I encourage you to approach your Friends of the Library group, if there is one, and ask for support. We table at our farmer's market to distribute seed and meet people face to face. We share seed with our community's food pantry and the community garden on the reservation and look forward to partnering with WIC, our state's supplemental food program for women, um, low-income women with children. In our first year, we partner with online free and share groups to bring reused materials, borrowed tools, seeds, skills, and people to create the first two annexes. We were invited as a nonprofit to table at our farmers markets in the second year. Because we leveraged social media to inform people of our mission in the first year, we attracted Rob Greenfield and the Live Like Alley Foundation to broadcast our mission and activities widely. Passionate people regularly volunteered at events where we received seed and cash donations. We gave presentations and partnered with many types of groups, and those are underlined above to communicate our mission, teach seed saving skills, and create a culture of sharing. We achieved nonprofit status in 2021, and last December, we raved in, raised enough funds to pay for all our expenses this year. The house, uh, the decisions that go into organizing and operating your seed library. What form will your seed library take? So much depends on where you're situating your library. Will it be con contained inside a public building or shop and available daily during business hours? Will it be in a little free library type shelter outside and open 24 seven? Will you have jars on shelves or a couple shoe boxes on a countertop? Or will it be housed in a full sized card catalog? Or will it be a combination of the above? When you first start, you may not even know what you'll need to consider beyond building your seed library. But this is where reaching out to other seed libraries, their seed keepers, and researching and connecting with seed saving initiatives online is a great help. We'll connect you with some of these resources at the end of our talk. How will you be organized? Part one. How will you organize your seed collection? Our seed library is situated in a public library organized in a traditional card catalog. And in our collection, seeds are categorized by general type and then common name within each category. There is a section each for flowers, herbs, grains, and vegetables. In the vegetable drawer, packets are alphabetized by common name, arugula, beans, beets, carrots, cauliflower, and so on, <clears throat> and then by varietal name within each category. We felt this would be the easiest and most welcoming approach for our particular community. Now that we have more non-English speaking patrons, it's working out well because it was simple enough to provide a list of the vegetables in two languages. We have one drawer set aside for our one seed, one community selection, and a couple of drawers set aside for our land race project seeds. All our seed is out all the time, except for some bulk seed that we store in a refrigerator. In this photo, you can see we include seed saving information on the wooden dividers we use between types of seed. The stoplight colored dots indicate how difficult it is to save seed from that type of plant. Green is the easiest, and red requires more steps if you're growing more than one variety of that plant type. Other libraries might want to arrange their collection differently by plant family, by seed saving difficulty, or especially if space is consideration, they may choose to only offer seed that is ready for planting that season. We established our seed libraries, as I said, as a network of seed libraries. And that idea was born from necessity. 
There was really no place for us to position our libraries indoors in 2020, but people were walking their neighborhoods and escaping cabin fever and they were getting to know their dogs even better. So we went grassroots. Three of our annexes are outdoors. One is inside a public library. Yes, that did happen. The one inside the library uses deep drawers and has lots of space. Our outdoor libraries have less space. We offer seeds by season and they are the, the season that they're best started in. We list the best seeds to start in spring, summer, fall and winter and fill the cabinets accordingly with these seeds. We post on socials what seeds are good to sow each month either by sowing directly or starting indoors. All the annexes contain seeds categorized by crop type, and you might be able to read those on the strawberry baskets in this picture. And we label each hand-packed envelope with the seeds common name, the variety if known, and scientific name, and that's optional. Seed keepers track in inventories to determine what seeds need to be replaced at the annexes, and they use a checklist for that. We only identify the Braska family because it's so broad and distinct. Our next steps are to identify seeds by seed saving difficulty with an indicator on the jar or envelope like pads and provide more scannable information by QR code at the annexes. How will you package your seed? Here you get a chance to look into one of Lauren's annexes on the left and then on the right, you can see one of our grab and go tables at the farmer's market. One decision you will make is will you leave the seeds in commercial packets or jars or repackage the seed? At the Round Valley Library, we do it both ways. The seed catalog drawers are filled with commercial packets so pa patrons can shake out what they want into number three size coin envelopes like you see in the baskets on the right. We also package up a portion of the seed, usually seed we have in bulk through purchase or donation. We offer some of these packages in our library's card catalog as many patrons appreciate that convenience. And we offer prepackaged seed at farmer's market events and to our community partners like our food pantry. During COVID, when the library was closed, everything was prepackaged uh, to grab and go. At that point, so little was known about how COVID was spread that we were masked and gloved while packaging the seed. Our first seed donations were almost 100% commercial seed packets. Now, after three years, we have a mix of about 70% commercially packaged seed, 20% bulk seed, and about 10% seed donated from local seed savers, which could be commercially packaged or locally grown. We draw from the community to help package seed. And last year, my daughter's eighth grade class were happy to fulfill their community service as volunteers. They labeled envelopes, processed and organized seed, created signs, tabled at the farmer's markets and the first annual seed swap. Their example brought other young people into our events. Since we opened our libraries during the pandemic, we had little to no direct contact with the public at the annexes. At the farmer's markets, we followed market guidelines for distancing, masking, and hand cleansing. How will patrons access seed? There are choices you will need to make uh, around seed access, and they include, will you limit access to members? Will your li library be self-serve? or will patrons request seed, which will be pulled for them? Will seed be available in limited or unlimited amounts? And how will you keep track of the comings and goings of seed? Will patrons write down what they take on a membership form? Will the seed packets be barcoded and checked out like books? Or will you just do a visual inventory once in a while to see what needs restocking? Everything is self-serve at our seed library annexes. It's basically an honor system and essentially people can borrow unlimited amounts. We use signage to curb their enthusiasm though, as the one you see here, reminding them to take only what they can grow at home and leave the rest for others. We don't have a membership system and we don't track who's borrowing seed and returning seed. It's just too much effort for a couple of us to do. 
However, we do track the number of commercial seed packets donated to us by seed companies. We keep an inventory of incoming seed packets in a spreadsheet using the same broad categories and common names as we do for the annexes. We do this to get an idea of how much seed we are receiving and passing to the community. We also receive bulk and package donations from local donors like um, garden centers. We package these into jars and coin envelopes. However, these donations are not recorded on the inventory sheet since they only make up about 10 to 30% of our inventory. Several libraries in our countywide system prefer to have people request seed online and have their seed librarians pull the seed for the patrons to pick up. We have a small staff and prefer open access, especially because in our community, there are so many people who don't have access to computers or the internet. We don't require a library card or identification. We ask people to fill out a membership form, but we don't require it. We do ask that patrons tell us how many packets they are taking with them for statistical purposes. Our county brochure states that there is a limit of 20 packets of seed per year per patron, but our library is well stocked and we have not had to enforce this limit. I can only think of one or two times in 10 years that I ever felt anybody was taking advantage of the library. By far, most people see it as a shared resource and are respectable respectful. However, it was the consensus of our seed librarians that it would be nice to have a stated limit in case someone tried to take away an unreasonably large number of packets. Prominent signage alerting your patrons as to how much seed they can take is helpful. How best to communicate procedures? The social media is a very important communication tool for us. It quickly informs how our seed library works, where the annexers are located, and what events we participate in or host. Lavender and I, that's my daughter there on the left, are creating, we're good at creating content and we still do almost all of it. If you use this mes method, it can create a good following within your community and eventually people will visit you in person or visit the seed libraries because of their connection with you online. These are some, there are some good tools to consider when you're creating social media. And I'll share a list of what I use in a document that you'll have access to at the end of our talk. Remember to create multilingual posts and signs. In our first year, a volunteer and intern who are multilingual significantly increased the amount of Spanish translation we offered through our website and in social media posts. My daughter reminds me that differently abled people appreciate photo descriptions and caption text and social media posts. So I do my best to incorporate those, but it's a learning process and that's slowly becoming a habit. QR codes and laminated forms and charts work well at our annexes and at the events. It brings people information quickly and, and they do, it does that while they're borrowing this or donating the seeds from the annexes. I love Lauren's videos and she's inspired me to do one for our library. Currently we have signage and a brochure that explain how to check out and return seeds but we also try to touch base with people as they come in and go over the procedures with them in person. Our community's Spanish speaking population has increased over the last few years. So we recently translated our introductory brochures into Spanish. To be honest, for us, it's been an ongoing challenge to get people to engage with printed material. So face-to-face -face communication has been the most successful. I think video will be a close second for us. How to acquire your seed. There are at least four ways to stock your library and most libraries probably use a combination of these. You can purchase seed, which we do when we're short on something or if we're wanting a larger amount of a specific kind of seed for a special project or programming. You can request expired seed from seed companies at the end of the season. You can accept donations from seed savers in your community, or you can start a seed garden. 
Seed companies that donate to our library include High Mowing Seeds, Seed Savers Exchange, Bounty Beyond Belief, So True Seed, Southern Exposure, Victory Seed, and Grow Organic. We'll have a list of seed companies who have worked with each of us in the presentation folder. Each year, we request and receive donations from seed companies and from local garden and hardware stores. If you're living within or near an agriculturally based area, you may find farms that grow diverse crops that are willing to donate their unused seed to your library. We receive bulk seed, mostly open pollinated heirloom and organic, from several culinary farmers that donate to our libraries when the chefs don't want to when the chefs want to rotate out certain crops and try new ones. This year we purchase seed as well. How will you encourage responsible seed saving and donations to your seed library? Well, the best way to encourage responsible seed saving is to learn and practice it yourself, then teach others. If we educate people about how to properly grow and save seed, we ensure that the seeds in the library are what the label says they are, and then they'll produce healthy plants when replanted. Otherwise, people will bring seed that came from a really delicious melon they brought at the grocery store, uh, which is likely a hybrid and not great for seed saving. So encourage beginning seed savers to start saving seed from self-pollinating plants like tomatoes, beans, peas, and lettuce. Let them know about the plant families that are more difficult to save seed from, like brassicas, which include cabbage, kale, broccoli, and cucurbits that are melons, cucumbers, and squash, among others in that family. Also, develop a policy, create signage, or develop a handout that describes the procedures your seed sav savers should take. Provide seed saving charts, or a book near the seed cabinet to serve as references for people to learn the basics. Create a donation form for incoming seed that asks for specific information, such as population size, isolation distance, pollination method, to document how the seed was grown and saved. For presentations and workshops on seed saving, post, or create like Lauren does, seed saving videos on your social media page. Make seed saving charts, brochures, or handouts available wherever you distribute seed. Let people know you encourage seed saving and explain the protocols that you want them to follow. The seed they donate should be open pollinated, mature, dry, clean, labeled, and saved from a number of healthy plants. If they grow other plants of the same species nearby, they need to take steps to prevent cross-pollination. There are documents in the presentation folder on seed saving that you might find helpful and are welcome to share with your patrons. How best to engage with your community. We use a variety of methods and honestly, we still don't reach everyone. We posted flyers around town, we post on social media, send MailChimp email announcements, and record radio PSAs to reach out to our community. We found that word of mouth works best, so be sure to ask folks to tell your friends about your goings on and events, and ask folks to share your events on social media. I totally agree with Pat. We use the same methods, but I find that people are still just discovering us. Even though we have a larger population, it's, a, it's still a big challenge. The more you partner with others, the faster and more broadly word is spread to people you wouldn't otherwise reach. For example, students from the Oxbow School and their teacher, they're pictured here, designed and built the Seed Library Annex at the CIA at Copia's Culinary Garden, and that's in the background. This is a high pedestrian area and the garden attracts lots of tourists and locals. The partnerships among these three education-based initiatives really help to spread the word about our mission and where to get free seeds. How will you inform and inspire? 
Once we had some time and experience under our belt, the Round Valley Seed Library started hosting events to encourage gardening and seed saving. Early each year, we host a series of seed library work parties. This is when we weed the catalog of expired seed and we incorporate new seed donations into the catalog. It's also when we package up bulk donations into our little seed library envelopes. All through spring, we host monthly seed planting parties at the farmer's market. We provide in-season seeds, potting soil, and plastic six packs, and people plant seeds to take with them to start and later transplant into their gardens. We also host seed exchanges, seedling swaps, and talks and workshops on beginning gardening and seed saving. We've done homegrown tomato tastings, established a monarch way station at the library, and had a grow out program called One Seed, One Community. We show films about seeds or seed adjacent subjects, Seed the Untold Story, Open Sesame, Symphony of the Soil. If you show films, learn about the legal requirements. You will need to secure public performance rights to show a film to the public. There will be information on showing films in the presentation folder. Some seed libraries have started their own seed gardens, but our library has not. Uh, we've successfully hosted many of the same events Pat mentioned, and we enjoy that outreach. Our first pilot project was to donate seedlings to help nonprofit gardeners to get their start for the year. These gardens grow for our local food bank. I completed an organic seed production course last year through Organic Seed Alliance, and I grew about uh, 22 pounds of locally adapted blue may seed. And that was given to me, uh, the initial seed was given to me by a food bank farmer that donated that seed to the library. Often when people notice that you've accomplished something that seems difficult and you encourage them to try it and support their efforts, they're inspired to do the same. I feel that if we inform people about locally grown food, Essentially, who does it, where they do it, and how, we can inspire them to do the same. <clears throat> That's me in the upper left with our grab and grow table during the pandemic. I just did another grab and go event, but this time I was able to uh, be present and chat with folks as they came to select seed for their gardens. To the right of that picture and below it, you'll see a group of Native students who are part of the Unity group here, assisting at one of our farmer's market planting parties. And in the bottom middle, there's my daughter and her friend at one of our farmer's market events. In the lower right corner, I was giving a seed saving talk at the other farmer's market. And then above, in the upper right um, is just a screenshot from a video that I did on um, easy seed saving using calendula. So what do you need to get started? Here's a bullet list of lots of the material that will really cover what you'll need to get started. I'm going to kind of run through these a little quickly because I know we're starting to get a little short of time. I want to give some time for questions. But you'll need a seed storage cabinet. This should offer a cool, dark, and dry interior space to hold your seeds. Outdoor cabinets will need protection from wind, rain, and sun. Indoor cabinets obviously don't have this problem. But lots of indoor cabinets are rescued seed card catalogs from schools and libraries. These are popular and work well, but so can sturdy shoe boxes and jars. They're great for smaller seed collections. Remember, seeds are living sources of nutrition and insects, rodents, bacteria, and molds will like them too. So make sure you preserve your seed collection for human use. Of course, you'll need the seeds. Desiccant packets and a thermometer with a humidity gauge are nice if you have an outdoor packet or in a warm, or in a warm moist environment. You'll need envelopes, different sizes, labels or rubber ink stamps for envelopes, Brochures, one for how, to see how the seed library works and one for the basics of seed saving. Signage, 
and a seed saving chart. A local planting calendar is handy. Um, seed saving books and we'll have a list of recommended titles in the, the folder. Um, both reference books for you and available for checkout. Labels for the outside of the drawers so people know to look for the seed they want. Dividers inside the drawers to separate different types of seeds. Um, membership form. Two to three binders. We leave a binder on the the seed catalog itself uh, with membership forms and handouts in it. We keep one behind the circulation desk with completed membership forms, and we keep one in the office for um, financial records and uh, masters of different things. Once you have a lot of members, you'll want alphabet dividers for your binder with the completed membership forms. Of course, pen, tape, scissors, and stamps, and measuring spoons to help with filling seed envelopes, both the traditional kitchen measuring spoons and then the very small ones, uh, like dash, pinch, and smidgen. As you do more outreach, a folding table, a pop-up canopy, chairs, and vinyl sign are nice to have. So what do you need to know about botany? As seed keepers, we do have a responsibility to learn some basic gardening and seed saving information. This doesn't mean you need to pursue an education in botany. Select and read brochures from your favorite seed libraries and study seed saving charts. Ask experienced gardeners who know more to help you understand the difference between open pollinated and hybrid varieties. Know why open pollinated plants and not hybrid ones are recommended for seed saving. Understand that varieties that share the same genus and species names can cross-pollinate with each other. They need special consideration and treatment to produce healthy, viable, true-to-type seed. Understand that self-pollinating and cross-pollinating species are on a spectrum. The more self-pollinating a species is, the fewer plants you'll need to maintain a variety and have viable seeds, and the smaller the isolation distance you'll need. The more outbreeding a species is, those that need insects or wind for pollination require larger populations and greater isolation distance. If this doesn't all make sense to you yet, don't worry. Just understand that there's stuff to know. Take it at your own pace and find a seed saving guide to consult while you learn. Also, read a little bit about land race gardening, which has become a hot topic of conversation when it comes to creating resilient, locally adapted plant varieties. Going to seed.org is a great place to start. So what comes next? Well, join the seed library community for sure. We learn best and keep our enthusiasm high when we stay in touch and share ideas, resources, and questions. Go to seedlibraries.weebly.com to join Upbeat and sign up for the Cool Beans newsletter. Check out Lauren's Napa County Seed Library website and watch her seed saving videos on YouTube. Visit the Round Valley Seed Library's webpage at frvpl.org slash seed hyphen library. It has lots of downloadable charts, forms, and handouts you're invited to use, and you'll see that listed on the resources page. Recommended reading. Here are some books we love. Uh, there's a list in the presentation packet you will receive when the links to this presentation go out. If you're a library, please try to acquire some books with information on gardening and seed saving in the languages spoken in your community. Along with these books, you can find some great seasonal resources on YouTube. Some of my favorite channels to follow are Ukwakwa, Our Foods, Seed Savers Exchange Heritage Farm, California Gardening, and Garden Answer. And Larissa will put these YouTube handles in the chat.
Our contact information and websites are on the right. And our websites. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and this resources that we have in different places for other um, great places to get some information online is on the left. Yes, yeah, so I'm um, adding a few more things to the chat to make sure that we have um, all of this great information right now. Um, but there are a few questions and I want to get to those um, and add those other um, items to the chat because you can always share those after the presentation. So people are really I'll focus on the um, most asked questions. Um, if people are asking about um, if you accept donated donated seeds from the public and what kind of guidelines you give to ensure viability and quality of seeds, people are wondering if you measure viability of the seeds. Um, okay, I can take that one. So the main guideline I give is that we want to have seeds that are clean, dry, and properly labeled. And we give them a list of things that they need to label their seed donations with. We do not do any germination of our seed because seed libraries aren't required to do that. I mean, that's really what is a part of the amendment to the California seed law, which says that we're exempt from that kind of testing so that we can freely share the seed. Now, given that, if I've gotten something from uh, someone that's a commercial seed packet that's more than three years old, I, I put that aside for some uh, schools to play with and some you know grow out or um, save it for like the collection of seed I do for like um, pine cone bird feeders or something like that. If it's, if it's more than like three to five years old, then I just set that aside. Um, but I don't do any germination testing unless I happen to test some seed. I want to, you know, oh my gosh, somebody gave me this um, California native. Let me see if this grows out. And then I happen to grow it myself. And then I know the viability. I do plant a lot of the seed that I get. So, but not because I want, I need to test it and then give somebody a percentage of viability. And there is going to be, there are a couple of things on seed donations in the presentation folder that people will have access to as well. So they don't have to be writing everything down frantically right now. <laughs> right. Questions are, uh, people are wondering if, um, how to sustain an, uh, an initiative like this. Do you depend on donations or are capital funds allocated for seeds each year? Uh, so people are wondering about the economic sustainability of these programs. Our friends group gets my library $400 a year. If that isn't enough one year, I, you know, they're very generous and I can ask for more, but generally that kind of covers it. But I, I do write to a lot of seed companies to ask for donations and they will give uh, the previous season's seeds that were returned to them. Um, so it, it doesn't cost a whole lot. Lauren, what about you? Right. Um, so the, to acquire seeds, I did the same thing that Pat did. I asked for donations from seed companies because the commercial seed cycle goes. They can sell packets through a retail location or through their own you know, uh, commerce for one year. And then after that, they have to retest that seed or donate it. So lots of seed companies have seed that they'll donate and they have programs online and you'll get that information on how to get that seed. But for the first two, three years, I, my family, we funded everything. And I was a bit ambitious with things um, for events. So the cost for envelopes and labeling and, 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 uh, you know, tabling materials like the canopy and all that I paid for. But as a nonprofit, you know, we had our, our um, forms in, but they weren't quite completed yet. Lots of um, places like the farmer's market and different venues for having presentations wanted us to come in for free. So we didn't have to pay a lot of those entry fees. Uh, by the time we got our nonprofit established, 
uh, established last year, we were able then to participate in our countywide fundraiser for nonprofits. And we raised about um, almost $7,000 for um, this year. So all our expenses are covered, but I did fund it a lot in the very beginning. All right, and then there a few just came in. Um, let's see, I get to my master list here. Um, some people were wondering, oh, what info you think, like what basic information would be required for the envelopes? Well, the crop type, so that's like herb, vegetable, flower, the common name, marigold, you know, pole bean, you know, uh, the variety, it might be, um, oh, Grandpa Ott's Morning Glory or a Kentucky Wonder Pole Bean. The scientific name is optional. We also do the year of harvest and uh, the gardener name, which is optional. But a lot of times uh, local folks like to let people know this is this is from my garden. Um, I also try to if it's a label I'm printing out something I've done in bulk, I, I put planting information when it should be planted, how deeply it should be planted in the spacing. Right. And Pat, what would you say are the most essential of any of those items? So for you to keep it, like, for instance. For me to keep it, I want to know uh, the variety, if it, you know, if, if it's a, a named variety and how old it is. Those, those are the most important to me. So I think we have time for one last question and then we'll um, be able to wrap up. Um, somebody was wondering what is the best time of year to uh, ask for seed donations or to, I think it was to ask for seed donations. I do that. I start it in about October, November. And if it's that late in the year, if they aren't ready to start sending it out, they'll generally hold on to the request. And we start getting seed donations. Well, sometimes I'll get them as early as November, but generally December and January are when we get the bulk of our donations. How about you, Lauren? Well, I got started late this year. I did the same last year around November. I started because I was so new and I had nothing. Um, but this year, because of that fundraiser in December, my all my attention was focused on that. So I didn't start requesting seed until about late January and even like this week. But interestingly, I've gotten quite a few um, responses very quickly. I think because now's the time that the seed companies are selling their seeds they're getting their income in, you know, everything's ready and processed. Then they can start feeling comfortable about or or they just are able to handle. OK, here's the stuff we want to give through our seed donation programs. I don't know, but I was very surprised that um, I got such a positive and quick response when requesting in February. But as you told me, you tend to do this a bit year round, right? Yes, I do. There are times I've requested seed in the summertime and have gotten it. Yes. Well, it's never too late. Right. So I think we're going to, yes, we want to urge everyone to join the 1 million seed, seed savers campaign. I added into the chat and I'm going to add it in right now. Also a collaborative grassroots project. Um, and, and after you've Join that. If you could also make sure that you um, fill out one of our feedback forms too, I will um, add that to the chat also. Again, I've added that a few times, but and then remember to post um, in your social medias. And oh, and there's a wonderful um, QR code too there also for the um, for the survey. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Ooh. Thank you. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks, Rowan. Thank Thanks, Rowan. <laughs> yes, we'll include the chats. Rowan, did you want to say anything to close out? 
Um, nothing formal, but just to say it's been really fun. Um, just hanging out in the chat, actually, and just seeing all the really interesting and really important questions that people have got. Um, and I think there is a session later, Ask a Seed Saver, I think, or Ask a Seed Librarian, which might be a place to bring some more of these questions um, if you have more. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's been really great to yeah see you all and hear from you, Lauren, and from you, Pat. Thank you. Thanks so much. We're going to end the session for now. Thank you.